So I want to talk um, about um, how the brain becomes wired up during development. Because of course, for the brain to function um, correctly, that depends on a very intricate and precise pattern of wiring during development. And um, I want to tell you uh, three different stories related to how the tips of developing axons find their targets in the brain. So if we, if we zoom in on the tip of a developing axon, we find that it's guided by a large number of molecular cues in the local environment. So at early stages of brain development, um, um, activity does not appear to play a role in establishing the initial pattern of wiring. I'll just... Um, rather... There's a number of molecular cues in the environment. And one of the most important type of molecular cue are molecular gradients. So here we have an in vitro experiment done by Andrew Thompson in my lab where we're releasing um, here nerve growth factor from the tip of this pipette here. We're looking down at the top, from the top at a, um, a culture dish here. And this is a, um, a rat neuron um, which is being guided towards that um, um, pipette because there's a gradient being set up here. And this structure at the tip of the developing axon, the growth cone, is detecting that gradient and um, changing the direction of movement of the axon in response to that gradient. So there's three things I want to talk about today. The first is how a small sensing device, such as a growth cone, which is only about 10 microns across, might be able to detect a concentration gradient. So that's a difficult computational problem. The second thing I want to talk about is um, how, once a growth cone's decided which grad gradient points, how it decides whether to be attracted or repelled by that gradient. So that's a different kind of computational problem to do with understanding the signaling transduction pathways inside growth cones. In the last part of the talk, I'll um, discuss some unpublished data where we tackle the problem of trying to understand the shape of the growth cone. So let me just play that movie one more time. Um, as, you, as you saw in the movie, the growth cone shape is uh, constantly changing. So the frame rate here is one per minute, and you can see um, that there's a very complicated dynamic morphology which is constantly evolving in time. And how that relates to external cues and what kind of computational role it might be playing in axon guidance is still, um, still a bit unclear. So we'll discuss that in the last part of the talk. So how could a small sensing device such as a growth cone detect a molecular gradient? Well, the, re the way a cell knows about the external environment is by the binding of ligand molecules to uh, receptors on its surface. And um, here we have a simple model of one-dimensional array of receptors which are feeding into some complicated signal transduction network. And the output of that uh, network is a decision about whether the gradient points left or right. Now, what makes this a difficult computational problem is um, that there are many sources of noise in this system. And the one I want to focus on is receptor binding noise. So the binding of ligand molecules to receptors is a fundamentally stochastic process. And it's only the probability of binding which is determined by the external concentration. So using standard Michaelis Menten kinetics, um, we can say that the probability of a receptor being bound is the concentration divided by the concentration plus the dissociation constant. And so each time we look at this um, uh, array of receptors, there'll be a different set of receptors bound. So how, given this, this, um, these continual fluctuations, um, this sensory uncertainty in the environment, how can we um, decide what's the, um, um, what's the best way to decide which way the gradient points? Um, so we hypothesize that the growth cone may be thinking about the Reverend Thomas Bayes, and in particular thinking about the optimal way to detect a gradient, which is to simply to compare the probability that gradient points right, given the pattern of binding, with the probability that gradient points left, given the pattern of binding. So using Bayes' theorem, we can um, calculate the probability of the binding, given that the gradient points right, and the probability of the binding, given the gradient points left, which are um, um, easy to calculate based on what we know about receptor binding kinetics. And then using Bayes, we can invert that to calculate uh, this ratio here, and thus the optimal decision for um, deciding which way the gradient points. So we're taking an ideal observer approach here. So. The result, oh, I should say that um, this, is the, uh, this was the PhD thesis of a, uh, a student, Duncan Mortimer, in the lab, um, helped by Peter Diane in London and Kevin Burridge at UQ and now at Oxford University. So uh, I'm not going to show you all the maths, but essentially Duncan was able to derive this formula, which is a prediction from this ideal observer model, of the proportion of correct decisions this um, sensing device should make. So, um, 
the proportion of correct decisions is just a half, which is the, the random value, modulated by um, um, a scaling constant, k, okay, times the gradient steepness, mu, so this is a fractional change across the width of the sensing device, times um, a function of the overall concentration. So this is the um, con dimensionless concentration, concentration divided by the dissociation constant. So, this is a prediction for how chemotactic performance should depend on the gradient parameters. So, this is a strongly sort of hy this is strongly hypothesis-driven modeling, and um, this model has, I mean, this, this prediction has basically um, only two parameters that you fit to the data, which are the scaling constant and the dissociation constant. Or you can look this um, dissociation constant up, in which case you just have one free parameter. So um, it's a very tightly constrained model. So the predictions of the model look like this. I'm sorry this is going off the edge here, but th this is, this is um, just um, a measure of chemotactic performance. This is the concentration, and the different colors represent the different, um, the different gradient steepnesses. So um, you can see that there's this complicated nonlinear dependence on concentration. At high concentrations and at low concentrations, you can't detect the gradient because there's either too many receptor bound or not enough receptors bound. Around about KD, uh, you get the optimal chemotactic performance. So this is a prediction both for growth cones and, in fact, any um, chemotactic device. So we were interested in growth cones and inter interested in determining um, their chemotactic performance experimentally. And it turned out turned out this was a difficult problem because the assays that have been proposed for studying axon guides have mostly been um, looking at the identity of the molecules involved and are not very um, well set up for asking very quantitative questions about um, how response varies as you make subtle changes in gradient parameters. So we developed a technology for um, creating uh, very stable gradients in collagen gels um, where you print onto the surface of the collagen um, um, the chemotactic factor you're interested in, this diffuses into the collagen and creates a gradient um, um, which is actually stays stable for a couple of days. And this is the kind of time scale um, which, which corresponds to the time, of time scale of which axons are being guided by gradients in vivo. And so using that technology, we were able to um, map out this sensitivity surface, how the um, um, chemotactic response of growth cones depends on both concentration and um, gradient steepness. And so these are the, uh, this is the experimental data here. So the experimental data was generated by uh, several people in the lab, and this is a collaboration with the lab of Linda Richards. And so you can see, at least qualitatively, the shape of these curves matches quite well with the um, uh, predictions of the, um, uh, the Bayesian ideal of observer model. And um, I don't have the slide here, but there's a, you, you can make more quantitative comparisons to show it's a pretty good fit. And so essentially, um, um, there's, you know, apart from this, this, this scaling constant, which when you plot the chemotactic, um, when you cap plot the experimental versus the theoretical, uh, against the theoretical data, that, that goes away. So essentially all we're doing is fitting the dissociation constant, and the dissociation constant turned out to be the same as uh, what's being measured experimentally using uh, more standard techniques. So, so this formula essentially applies to any uh, chemotactic system and can be used to predict chemotactic performance um, in any system. And um, what we've shown here is that um, Consistent with the prediction, growth cones are only sensitive to gradients over a, a relatively narrow range of concentrations, about two orders of magnitude. So this has consequences for understanding, for instance, um, therapies for regeneration. It's no good just to dump in a lot of uh, some chemotropic factor. It needs to be at the right concentration in order to be effective in guiding axons. Okay, so that's the first story I wanted to tell you. The second one... Uh, yes, so, 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 so these, these are the gradient steepnesses experimentally, and so this is over 10, 10 microns, yes. So these were very, very shallow, very shallow gradients. There's a lot more I could say about that, but we'll come back to that at the end of the um, So the second, um, the second story is about how um, a growth cone interprets a gradient once it's decided which direction it points in. So here is exactly the same um, kind of neuron, exactly the same uh, kind of gradient of nerve growth factor, but now the growth cone is being repelled rather than attracted. And um, Mooming Poo and colleagues showed that um, you can get this behavior when you reduce cyclic AMP levels in the, um, um, in the medium. So reducing cyclic AMP converts attraction to repulsion. The calcium also plays an important role. 
And so this is a schematic summarizing many experiments of people like Mu Ming and um, James Zheng. So green here represents an, a chemotropic factor which is normally attractive. So when you have a uh, normally attractive factor, that produces a steep internal gradient of calcium. Perhaps I'll use the point here. Steep internal gradient of calcium, and that causes the growth cone to be attracted. When you have a normally repulsive factor, shown in red, that produces a shallow internal gradient of calcium. And that, even though the calcium gradient is still pointing in this direction, that causes the growth cone to be repelled. This is also dependent on the absolute level of calcium. So if you lower background calcium levels, then a normally attractive um, factor produces, okay, perhaps I won't do that. A normally att attractive factor produces um, repulsion. If you raise um, background calcium levels, a normally repulsive factor produces attraction. So you get this very complicated set of behavior of, um, in terms of how calcium and cyclic AMP levels determine the response of growth cones, how the growth cones interpret gradients. So in order to make sense of that, um, we proposed a very simple model of a growth cone consisting of two compartments, so this very simplest way of introducing a spatial dimension across the growth cone. And um, based on work of people like James Eng, we imagined that there was this simple signal transduction network in each side, operating in each side of the growth cone. So the input is calcium, and the output is the ratio of CAM kinase 2 to calcineurin. And um, so we hypothesized that it's the side of the growth cone with the largest ratio of CAM kinase 2 to calcineurin um, which is the side to which the growth cone turns. And this is interesting because the output of this network is, is um, non-monotonic, and that's how you get lots of interesting um, behavior to do with differences in input calcium levels. So the assumption of the model is that you have, um, the, the gradient produces a difference in input calcium level, and then we read out how that affects the output level. So this was work of um, Libby Forbes in the lab who did the modeling, and Andrew Thompson and Jaja Yuan who did the experiments. So, um, for the signal transduction model, we uh, borrowed a model um, from Michael Grabner and Nick Brunel, proposed in the context of the switch between long-term potentiation and long-term depression, which actually uses, um, they hypothesize it uses exactly the same network, so we were able to uh, borrow their model, but have kind of two copies um, next to each other. And the, um, the results of the model look like this. So this shows the ratio of uh, the outputs from the two sides. So if this ratio is above one, we hypothesize that leads to attraction. If it's below one, that leads to repulsion. And the three curves so, show different cyclic AMP levels in the model. And um, so black corresponds to normal cyclic AMP levels. So you can see there's a, um, um, a critical range of calcium for which you get attraction. For low calcium or high calcium, you get repulsion. And then this blue curve shows the effect of reducing cyclic AMP levels, which shifts this curve to the right on the calcium axis. Now, one of the most interesting things about this is the predictions it makes. So these points here correspond to um, experimental data, which was already, um, um, already available, which we used to help validate the model. But then the model makes a number of novel predictions. And perhaps the most interesting is that at high calcium levels, so if you raise calcium, and uh, normal cyclic AMP, you don't get attraction anymore. And the way to recover attraction in that case is to raise, uh, is to, sorry, lower cyclic AMP levels to put you onto this blue curve here. So contrary to sort of textbook wisdom, this suggests that there's a complicated interaction between calcium and cyclic AMP. And sometimes to promote attraction, you actually need to lower cyclic AMP levels rather than raise them, depending on background calcium levels. And again, that's, this has implications for, um, um, for therapies for regeneration. People have been very interested in cyclic AMP levels, for instance, in the regenerating spinal cord. And um, um, it's not just as simple as raising those, those levels. In some circumstances, you may, may need to lower those levels to induce attraction again. So um, um, we recently reviewed uh, the role of calcium in axon guidance. This is in the current, current issue of Trends in Neuroscience, and I apologize for the cheesy picture. Okay, so in the second half of the talk, uh, the last part of the talk, I want to discuss um, some unpublished work we've done uh, on uh, growth cone morphology. So this is, this is rather different. The first two parts were sort of hypothesis driven. Here we're taking a more uh, neuroinformatics approach and uh, um, generating a large data set of movies of growth cones and trying to extract information from those movies in a more sort of bottom-up way. So the basic questions we were trying to address are, what are the basic shape primitives of growth cones? How do these change over time? And how do these relate to growth cone movement? So for that, we had um, many people in the lab. Um, Richard and Daniel here did the computational analysis, and um, the others did the experimental work. And this is a collaboration with Ethan Scott's lab. And 
So here is the basic um, set of data we were working with. I won't go through all these uh, different conditions, but the main point is we had um, several hundred movies, time-lapse movies of growth cones growing in vitro, and altogether about 50,000 individual frames of um, growth cones. So there's been some beautiful um, prior work trying to understand growth cone morphology based on looking at just a very, very small number of growth cones and using you know, the intuition of the observer to, to, to try and classify what kind of patterns, shape patterns those um, growth cones are going through. Here we used um, rather a more sort of big data approach where you just take a whole bunch of data and you try and extract in, a, in, a, in an unbiased way what are the um, um, key sort of statistical principles underlying um, this data set, in this case, growth cone morphology. So the way we did that, um, so first we had to automatically extract the outlines, of course. Um, we can't have a student sitting there tracing 50,000 um, growth cones. And so um, Richard wrote some, some, some image processing software to automatically cap capture the outlines of um, growth cones from these movies. And then we performed what's called an eigenshape analysis. So um, if you haven't heard of eigenshape analysis, don't worry, because it's just principal components analysis in a space of shapes. So essentially, we take each of these 50,000 frames, uh, we extract the outline, and then we parameterize it. So you need some way of parameterizing the shape. So we parameterize the shape by putting uh, a lot of dots around the outside of the growth cone. So, um, uh, 250 dots, and each of those has an x and a y coordinate. So in other words, we have 500 numbers which describe the shape of the growth cone there. So you can think of that as being a point in a 500 dimensional space, as at this point, in my experience, biologists' heads start to explode. But um, here, here are two dimensions, and you just have to imagine the other 498. Um, and so from that, so, so that's a single shape in that space, and um, when we take our 50,000 frames, you get a whole cloud of uh, points in that space. And then we perform principal components analysis in that space to extract the dimensions uh, along which there's most variance. So this is trying to ask which are the dimensions of the shape space which have the most variance. So the way, um, so here's the answer to that question. And um, the way you normally uh, represent eigenshapes is that you show the mean shape in green. So each of these is, a, is, is one of the principal components. And the mean shape is the same in each case, that's in green. And what we're showing is the shape one standard deviation in each direction along that shape axis. Because you have to try and represent how shape changes as you move through that axis in the space. So here are, um, um, so here's the first principal component captures 37% of variance in the data set. And very neatly that represents bending right versus bending left. So this is saying, if you had to characterize growth cone morphology by one number, uh, the, the one number which preserves the most variance is just um, telling you whether the growth cone is bending to the right or bending to the left. The second principal component, 20% of the variance, is um, um, basically measuring thinness versus fatness of the growth cone. So moving one way, you have a thin growth cone. Moving the other way, you have a fat growth cone. Then moving further down, you have uh, these more subtle variations. So here you get a bending to the left, then a bending to the right. Here you get another version of thinness versus fatness. And here you get bending to the right, then bending to the left, then bending to the right again. And um, so you get this kind of hierarchy of, um, of, of these kind of shape primitives which um, capture the, the, um, the most important sources of variance in growth cone shape. Okay, so the next interesting question, so, so, so this, is, this is a set, this is a property, these shapes are a property of the entire data set. The next question is how the projections onto these shapes vary through time for an individual growth cone. So here is um, a growth cone doing its thing, here's the outline, and this will start again in a moment. Here are the uh, projections, measured, measured by a z-score, onto the top four uh, modes. And um, so this is saying that this growth cone is bending one way, then bending the other way, and so on and so on. Similarly, go through variations in thinness versus fatness. And you can hopefully start to see here, there's a hint of some periodicity in this behavior. So to analyze um, this periodicity, we um, measured autocorrelations and Fourier power spectra. So here is the set of autocorrelations and Fourier power spectra for the top few modes for one growth cone. Um, these movies um, you know, are a few hours long. So, so here we have, um, you can see oscillations in the um, first mode, the bending right versus bending left. You can see very strong oscillations in the second mode, which is thinness versus fatness. And so on, you see oscillations going down in all the modes, and you see nice sharp peaks in the, in the Fourier power spectra. So that's one growth cone, has nice oscillations. Here's another growth cone. It has, also has nice oscillations, but these are, um, these are, a different set of oscillations from the first growth cone. And basically, each growth cone seems to have its own sort of unique set of shape oscillations. So this periodic behavior. Now, these, um, these don't actually 
uh, predict which way the growth cone is going to go. So these growth cones are generally going straight, but they're kind of wiggling back and forth as they, they go straight. They're not, they're not doing that. They're just kind of doing that. And the, I should say the time scale of these is about, uh, there's a, a variety of time scales, but the basic time scale is about 20 minutes of, of this oscillation. So we come back to try and understand uh, where that time scale comes from in a moment. Um, so it turns out these mode scores and oscillations actually predict the movement. So if you look at how far a growth cone has traveled over an entire movie and ask, um, are there any um, properties of the oscillations which predict the amount of movement, the strongest correlations are with the, um, the score here, which is a measure of the strength of the oscillation. So the strength of the oscillation in this mode, which is thinness versus fatness. Um, there's a correlation with the frequency of the R1 mode, which is bending left versus bending right. And if you put the top few modes into a regression prediction, trying to use the strengths and periods of those um, oscillations to predict the uh, distance moved, you'll find that there's uh, actually gives quite a strong prediction. So in other words, uh, growth cones with strong, fast oscillations are moving more quickly. And um, I asked, I challenged the lab to come up with a catchier way of remembering that, and Daniel came up with this. Okay, so I'm almost uh, done. So we found that similar modes and oscillations were present um, in vivo. So, so far all the data I've shown you is in vitro, and of course one might say all this, um, all this behavior, this dynamic behavior we observed is just uh, an artifact of the in, vivo in vitro environment. So um, in collaboration with Ethan Scott, we use some of his uh, zebrafish where um, there's a very small proportion of retinal ganglion cells which are labeled with uh, green fluorescent protein, and um, we did time-lapse imaging of the movement of those uh, growth cones across the tectum as those um, axons try to pathfind. So this is just a static um, uh, picture, but um, we, um, we, we, you can do time-lapse imaging of these growth cones, and then you can do the same, same analysis, right? And the, um, what we found from that analysis was that we get exactly the same kinds of um, shapes, the same kinds of oscillations. So it's, um, it's, it's not just a property of the in vitro environment. So just in the last couple of minutes, um, I want to discuss a possible explanation for this. So I don't know if anybody's um, had any thoughts about what kind of um, processes inside the growth cone might lead to periodic behavior on a time scale of 20 minutes. Um, it stumped us for a, for, a, for a very long time until we had a, a revelation that it might be something to do with dynamic uh, microtubule instability. So uh, here's a, uh, a schematic showing microtubules invading um, the peripheral region of a growth cone. And you see sometimes they extend quite a long way into the growth cone. And um, microtubules undergo these characteristic phases of growth and retraction. Um, and um, so maybe this has something to do with the oscillations. So to investigate that computationally, um, we discovered that there was this fantastic model from um, right here in the Netherlands, um, from uh, General Vesius, my apologies for the pronunciation, Van Pelt and, and, and Van Oyen, um, where they considered microtubules um, growing together in a limited volume where they're competing for a supply of tubulin monomers. So the basic equations of the model um, are are like this, so you have a, um, a growth phase, so this is the length of the microtubule, and it's related to the concentration of free tubulin, and then you have a shrinkage phase, um, where they, they, they shrink, and then they switch between these growth and shrinkage phases, phases with a frequency, depends, which also depends on the concentration of free tubulin. And um, these authors showed that this model produced a very nice fit to the behavior of microtubules um, uh, measured from real data. So we looked at a very simple version of this model where we just have two microtubules competing in a, in a small volume uh, in a growth cone for um, tubulin. And here sh this shows the length of those two molecular tubules as a function of time. So blue is one and red is the other. As you can see, as one starts to grow, uh, the other one doesn't tend to grow at the same time because they're, you know, they're competing for the same supply of tubulin. And so if you plot, if you look at the length, the, the ratio of the lengths as a function of time, um, and then plot the autocorrelation, you get an autocorrelation function that looks a bit like this. This is very preliminary data. But um, essentially, this, um, the, the period uh, as measured from this is about 20 minutes. So um, it exactly matches the um, period we've um, measured in, in vitro. So at the moment, we're pursuing the idea that um, these, this, the, at, at, at the root, these oscillations may be driven by the dynamic instability of microtubules. OK, so that's all I have to show you. So to conclude, um, I discussed how a Bayesian model predicts the response of axons to molecular gradients, how calcium and cyclic AMP interact to determine attraction versus repulsion in axon guidance, and then how eigenshape analysis can help reveal new features of the dynamic uh, morphology of growth cones. So thank you very much for your attention.
So, so the, first, the first model, it seemed to me, the Bayesian model sort of assumes a kind of static position of the head, and then you show that the oscillations. So how do you, and you've got good data for the first one. Right, so, for the second. Yeah, so, so the first one sort of simplifies things into, you have a series of snapshots of the gradient. Obviously, you'll improve your performance if you average over time. Um, but essentially, it's just looking at, you know, um, the most reduced kind of idea about gradient sensing poss possible. But um, you're getting at a very important point, which is maybe these um, oscillations, especially waving back and forth, are in some way helping to um, optimize gradient detection. And that's, that's a very interesting idea, which we are kind of thinking about how to pursue at the moment. The shape changes in the, in the growth cone and the redirection are strongly mediated by uh, the actin meshwork in the lamellipodia. Yes. So the dynamic uh, behavior of depolymerization and polymerization. Can you make a link between your ChemKinase 2 and uh, cyclic AMP model with respect to the behavior of the actin meshwork? Right, thank you. Um, so so, so um, let me just answer the question which I thought you were asking for, for, first to start with, which was, um, uh, aren't we ignoring actin in, in this model of microtubule dynamics? And, um, well, at the moment we are, but of, we're not saying that actin is not important in, um, in driving these things as well. But in terms of um, putting actin in the picture in the calcium and cyclic AMP model, um, so we haven't really thought about how to do that. So, you know, we're, we're basically looking at the signaling at a particular level. So we're assuming um, the, you know, receptor um, signaling has been converted into a calcium concentration, and then we're not considering what happens downstream of those chemkinase 2 to calcineurin levels in terms of, um, you know, um, RAC and RO and CDC40 and so, so on. Um, I mean, that would be an interesting thing to do, but we, we haven't attempted to do that. Thank you.